what I hear every day of the week from constituents who are contacting me is that they're terrified that uh, if the Prime Minister makes good on his rash statements, then on the 31st of October, this country could be crashing out of the EU with no deal. And I hear all sorts of things from people, people worried about what's going to happen, about medicines, about treatment, the health sector, their jobs, manufacturing, what's going to happen to our public services. And I, I don't think people are making it up. I think people are genuinely worried. And I have to tell you, I'm genuinely worried, and I think my colleague Liam Byrne here is worried as well. So what we thought we would do tonight is we thought we would bring together a group of people who've got some understanding of the things that we're facing, and we thought we would ask them um, later in the evening to take part in a question and answer session where we'd have a chance to hear what people think is at risk and what they think we can do about it. And uh, we've got a really high-powered panel here. We've got Nick Wolves from Hope Not Hate, a man who's probably done more to actually work for cohesive communities and take on the spectre of the far right than anyone I know. <laughs> We've got Councillor Bridget Jones, who as well as being a councillor in Selly Oak, is also the deputy leader of Birmingham City Council. She's one of the few local authority women leaders in this part of the country. And she is the woman who is charged with Brexit preparations for the council. <laughs> We've got Richard Arthur from Thompson's Solicitors. I should just say, Thompson's have sponsored this event tonight. And if it wasn't for them, it would be much harder for us to put this on. So I'd like to say a big thank you to Thompson. <laughs> Richard is the head of uh, trade union affairs at Thompson's, is that right? He's an expert in employment law and contract issues. He spends most of his working life trying to protect those working rights that people have against folk who are trying to avoid them. Richard Arthur, thank you very much. <laughs> And we have Dame uh, Julie Moore. Uh, some of you will remember Julie as the chief exec of the University Hospitals Birmingham, where she did such a great job in improving the delivery and the quality of healthcare in this area. She has moved on now, but not that far. She's now a professor down at the Warwick Manufacturing Group. Julie Moore. <laughs> And uh, last but not least, we've got Ravi Subramanian. Ravi uh, is the regional organiser for Unison. He's a man who knows a lot about trying to protect people in low-paid jobs, about trying to stop public services which are under attack, and about trying to stand up for the rights of workers. Ravi. <laughs> So I'll be returning to the panel later. Now look, whatever your view about Brexit, what people are telling me now is they never thought it would be like this. They didn't think back in 2016 that we would end up at this point. Now there's various things we can do. We can wring our hands and say, oh, ain't it awful? And, we can try and crawl into a hole. Or we can say, look, this isn't what any of us signed up for. Whether you're a lever or a remainer, we didn't intend to end up at this point. Nobody said in 2016 that no deal was the tra trajectory they were heading for. We were promised there would be a negotiated deal, there would be a settlement, and that 
we would actually benefit from it. That doesn't seem to be where we're heading now. But I think when you're in this situation, you can either have bluff and bluster, and we're seeing quite a lot of that from a particular individual at the moment, or you can take a considered view of the situation, you can analyse the problems that are facing us, and you can try and work to find a way out of it. And I'm delighted tonight we've got a man who is capable of doing all of those things, a man who understands what it is to negotiate with the European Union and with other world leaders, a man who believes in finding solutions in a way forward, a man who knows how to face a crisis and resolve it, a man who believes in putting his country first and not any other consideration. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an absolute privilege to welcome our former Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Gordon Brown. Well, what a, a real privilege it is, a real pleasure it is uh, to be back in Birmingham, to be here at the centre of British industry and commerce, to be in the West Midlands, which is at the heart of British manufacturing, to be here, the home of the car industry of this uh, country. Uh, and so for me, it's a great pleasure, and there is nowhere better to talk about the future of our country than here in Birmingham. And to be here at King's Head School, I've just met the new headmaster. These are all the new prefects. I've just talked to them. The best argument for giving the vote to people at 16. Great, great young guy. And, um, and, and as you know, I'm just the warm-up speaker for a wonderful panel that you've just been introduced to. And I'll say something about them in a minute. And it's a real pleasure to speak here with Steve McCabe. I've worked in Parliament with Steve McCabe over nearly 20 years. Uh, no one fights harder for his constituents. No one knows more about what's happening locally and can express it in Parliament and be the voice of Birmingham in Parliament. And it's a great pleasure always to speak with Steve McCabe and I commend his work uh, to you. Now, I want to talk about Brexit. I know everybody talks about Brexit now, but I want to talk about the facts. I want to talk about what's really happening. Because whether you were for or against Brexit, whether you were for remain or for leave, whether you were a yes or no to Europe, whether you're a government supporter in general terms or support any of the other political parties, whatever you do, I want to show you tonight that a no-deal Brexit will be a disaster for this country. You see, if I was Prime Minister at this point in time, I would want to be able to guarantee to people that the manufacturing components that our industries need will come into the country and not be disrupted. I would want to be able to guarantee that our food supplies 40% of which come from outside Britain, will come into the country and not be disrupted. I would want to be able to guarantee that our medical supplies for our health care would be coming into this country. And remember, a million consignments come in every day from mainland Europe that are items for our health service. A million items every day. And I'd want to be able to guarantee that they were able to come in without disruption. And if I could not guarantee that, then I would not want to go ahead with a no-deal Brexit. I could not recommend to the country that it was in our interest to put at risk food supplies, medical supplies, the supplies to our industry. And I would have to say that it was a self-inflicted wound for us to go ahead with a no-deal Brexit if I could not guarantee that the food and the medicines and the components for industry could come into our country. So I just want to explain to you what I already know and what I think the public have got to know about what's really happening. If you take the ordinary car that is produced uh, in the Midlands or produced in any other part of the country, it has on average 30,000 separate components. 30,000. And 15,000 of these components come from abroad. We're such an integrated world economy that if you're producing a car not every part is going to come from this region or this country. 
Thousands of them are going to come from outside this country. And 12,000 different parts of the average car come from mainland Europe. So every day, there's more than 1,000 lorries bringing in components through the ports, uh, through the uh, customs uh, uh, areas, and bringing them into this, into this country. And if you take Toyota at Derby, they have said that on November the 1st, they will have to stop production because they cannot guarantee that they have the supplies coming in that are necessary for this supply chain, which is just in time. So they've only got a few hours of components in stock, and they're relying on these glories coming in. The problem is that our country's future depends on having a successful car industry, a successful manufacturing industry. We make about 1.6 million cars a year. Only 280,000 of these are sold in Britain. The rest, more than a million, go to mainland Europe. So we don't just bring in our components from Europe, we sell most of our cars to Europe. And if there are tariffs placed on these cars, they become more expensive. And then they are not sold in the markets that we're appealing to. Then we lose the business, lose the trade, and we lose the jobs. And there are 800,000 people in Britain that are dependent on the car industry. 180,000 people working in the car industry, like in Jaguar, Land Rover, and thousands working in the supply sector and in the retail sector of the industry. So it is a vitally important industry to this country, as everybody in this city and in this region knows. And anything that puts it at risk is very dangerous for the future of jobs as well as the future of prosperity of every shop, of every retail center, of every small business uh, in, in the area. Now, I fear for the future of the car industry, because what's happening at the moment is around the country, they're all making announcements. You may have picked up some of them, but if you look around the country, at uh, Swindon, they're leaving. Honda is leaving Swindon. Ford is leaving Bridge End. Astra, uh, Vauxhall, now owned by uh, the French uh, at uh, Ellesmere Port. They're threatening to leave if a no-deal Brexit goes ahead. Nissan said they had an agreement with the government, and now they're changing their mind about what they might do in Sunderland. And the reason is that the car industry is about to undergo this massive transformation. Electric cars, driverless cars, dieselless cars. Every company is having to change dramatically and make new investment in the country, but they're asking which country? Because if one and a half million cars are produced, but most of them go to mainland Europe, people are saying, why not make the investment in mainland Europe? In some countries where labor costs are even cheaper, in Spain or in Hungary or in Poland. And remember Jaguar Land Rover, the parts, I looked at it the other day, the parts that they use for the Land Rover, they, some come from Romania, from Hungary, from Germany, from France, from Netherlands, all these countries producing parts for Jaguar Land Rover. And at some point, someone will say, if you're selling the Land Rovers there, uh, and if you're getting components for there, and it costs more money to bring them into this country, and there's all these delays, why not make them somewhere else? We have got to defend our car industry. We have got to defend the future of manufacturing in this country. We have built up a car industry over the last 30 years, and we must not allow it to be put in jeopardy. But I tell you, no deal Brexit is a huge blow at the heart of the car industry. Now, the government says Brexit is about taking back control. But if we lose control of our car industry, it's not taking back control. It's us surrendering control when we should be in a healthy, thriving industry, building with new investment for the future. So when I look at a no-deal Brexit and look at what might happen after November the 1st, but not just what happens in the next few days if the channel ports are clogged up, but what happens to the investment decisions that companies make for the next few years, if there's to be tariffs, if there's to be holdups, if there's to be customs clearances, if the parts can't get in and out, if you can't go back and forward in the way you used to, then we are in danger of losing. Now, the car industry is vital to this region, but to every family in every region, medical supplies for our health service are vital too. Now, I said there were a million consignments come in every day from continental Europe. It's an amazing figure when you think about it. All the different drugs on which we depend, all the different medical treatments. Yes, many are produced in Britain, and we sell a lot to continental Europe, 
but might not be able to do so if there's tariffs placed on them and they become more expensive. But for the safety and security of patients, just think of all these drugs and medical treatments and consignments that are coming in from mainland Europe that may be put at risk. And the commercial director of the National Health Service, the man who buys the goods and supplies and has to negotiate the price and everything else, has said that even after all the preparations that the government talks about, even after storage that is going to happen, that they're going to uh, store them for six weeks, that's the plan, even after flying in some of the supplies, which is one of the plans they've got, even after charting some more boats, he is saying you'll have severe shortages for three months and serious shortages for six months. Now, these are life-saving drugs where you cannot afford to have shortages. And these are important, of course, not just to every patient in the country, but every family who wants to see their loved ones properly provided for. Now, I don't know if you've seen the newspapers recently. There are shortages already, not necessarily because of Brexit, but simply because of a number of other factors around the world. And there are shortages in a whole series of drugs and treatments. And the pharmacists have been reporting, and there's an article, I think I've got it here, but I'll, I'll not bore you by reading it, going through all the different things that we need. Antidepressant drugs, painkillers, uh, statins, all these different things. And where short hormone therapy and where the shortage is starting to develop. But what people are really worried about is you can't get through if you have a delay in goods getting into the country. So if a third of the goods are stopped, then that's a third of a million packages or items, medical consignments, every day. If it's half, then that's half a million. And you're starting to talk about, even if you try to stockpile, you're still going to run out quite soon of the drugs you need. Now, let me give you just four examples, because I've been looking at them. EpiPens, my son actually depends on having an EpiPen because of his allergies. And many people here will know people or may themselves use EpiPens. You know that last winter, there was a real problem because there was a fire in a factory in Germany and EpiPen production slowed down. And you know what then happened? That they had to say that the EpiPen will have a longer use-by date. So instead of being cancelled at a certain date as it should have been, it had a longer use-by date. You know also that the prescriptions, which normally are for two EpiPens for safety reasons, came down to one in many cases. But that's before Brexit. And most of the EpiPens that we use in Britain are produced in mainland Europe. So for anybody who's got an allergy, who's relying on an EpiPen, we cannot be absolutely certain that we can now guarantee that the production and the supply of them is going to be as, as before. And then take insulin for diabetics. And there are three million diabetics in this country. A million depend on, on insulin. And the supply of insulin, again, uh, is mainly uh, from mainland Europe and a few companies that produce it that we rely on. But if the insulin does not get in, and of course, if it's delayed, then we are putting uh, some people's lives at risk. And insulin is absolutely vital uh, to the safety of so many different people. And then take radioisotopes for the treatment of cancer. And I know something about this, this as well. These radioisotopes that are necessary for the detection and for the treatment of, of cancer, they're brought into the country, but they've got a use-by date. They've got to be used very quickly, otherwise they become totally ineffective. So you cannot stockpile them for weeks on end and hope that these radioisotopes can be used. Again, we've got a problem. And then take flu. This winter, you probably have seen the Australian flu that is, uh, that is now uh, descended from uh, uh, down there, and people are worried that that is the flu that is going to come here. So they've had to reconfigure the flu vaccine for this winter, uh, and that raises additional problems, because now it's got to be produced in record numbers, because the plan is to get to 30 million people this year. But already we know that a million of these doses will not be available at the end of October, and may not be available until December, and may even be delayed beyond that. So here you have four examples, and there's many more uh, that I could, I could give you, and maybe you will know many more examples. If you disrupt the supply of something that you've relied on, if you can only stockpile to a certain uh, amount, and if, as the Royal College of Pharmacists is saying, the Royal College of Radiologists is saying, the Royal College of Physicians is saying, in all these vital areas I've just described, they cannot guarantee that these drugs will be available. 
Why does a government go ahead with a no-deal Brexit when they know that this is potentially damaging to people? You can't say that this is a threat to Europe that's not going to hurt you. This is like a gun at your own head that you're pointing at your own head and say you're going to fire if someone doesn't do what you want to do. It is a self-inflicted wound. It is an own goal. And to dress it up as a patriotic act and to say that not to do it is a betrayal just makes a mockery of what is the real national interest in this matter. And then... <laughs> and then And then take food supplies, because of course we will be able to provide food, of course. But remember that a few years ago, 75% of our food was produced in Britain. And now with all the changes and the interconnections and interdependence of the economy, it, it's only 60%. So 40% of the food we eat comes from outside Britain. And about 30%, I think it's 29%, 28%, comes from mainland Europe. And so as you get into particular seasons, uh, soft fruit, 70% comes from mainland Europe, tomatoes, 80%, 90%, lettuce, and all that sort of thing. You could go through the different things. And of course, you can change your diet and change your food and, and, and eat things that are different. And certainly, there'll be plenty of Welsh lamb available because they'll not be able to export the lamb to Europe as a result of the tariffs that are imposed on that. But just think what's going to happen. If you have delays at the ports, and if you then have these delays going on for some days, what the estimate that the government has had to report is that these delays could cause a third of our food supplies to be at risk, and it could happen over a period of at least three months until things get sorted out. Now, what's going to happen, of course, is that the price of food is going to rise. And it's already starting uh, to happen. And so as people stockpile, and as people uh, try to make sure that they've got enough provisions on their own, uh, then people ask questions about where the food supply is coming and what's, what's going to cost. Now, the Cabinet Secretary, that's the most senior civil servant in Britain, uh, and he's not a politician, so he's not someone who's got an axe to grind in this matter, he says food prices will rise 10% at least. Other people say food prices will go even higher. A lot depends on whether the pound goes down and to, at what level it goes down. Uh, and if it goes down 10, 15, 20%, then, of course, the price rise would be, even, would be even higher. So you've got a real problem for people who are the most vulnerable. Because food banks are struggling to cope at the moment. They're struggling to meet the needs of people. I see it in my old uh, constituency, because we've got a food bank that has got record numbers of applications at the moment, and you must know this here. We've got families who are really struggling to make ends meet. And every time you hear of the circumstances, it ends up not that people are willfully unemployed, it's that people are paid low wages and cannot make ends, ends meet. <laughs> and, and of all the announcements the governments have made about what they're going to do for this and for that with money that they're not sure that they have and can't guarantee they have after Brexit, None of these announcements have been more help for people who are really in need, the people who depend on food banks. And when you get to a situation where food banks may not be able to afford the food that you need, then you're really dealing with a crisis in, in our country. And I do fear for the unity of this country and for the cohesion of communities and for the anger that is starting to mount, not just over the politics of Brexit, but over the sense of injustice that people feel that they're being left out and left behind and they're not being taken into account. Now, this is not the Brexit we were promised. I think I heard Steve saying that exactly at the beginning. I remember the referendum debate. I was here in Birmingham on the day before the referendum, uh, speaking in Birmingham, and I remember the debate, and nobody said that a no deal, uh, that, that, that Brexit would mean a no deal Brexit. I remember the words, and I've checked them up since. <laughs> they, said, they said it would be careful change, not a sudden stop. They said there would be flexibility and stability. In the Conservative Manifesto of 2017, they said that Brexit would be, uh, this, 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 this were the words, they said, they said that Brexit would be smooth and orderly. Just like, remember, they said they would have strong and stable government over these last few years. 
And I remember Boris Johnson. He said he would be quite happy being in the single market. I remember that guy, Nigel Farage, and he was saying he'd be quite happy. He said, Norway, Switzerland, if we had a relationship with Europe like that, that would be fine. Only later did he become an advocate of a relationship that was totally different from Norway and Switzerland. So if you look at the evidence, this no-deal Brexit is not the no deal is not the Brexit that we were promised. And I think it's time for every group in the country to say, yes, we can disagree on whether we go ahead with leaving Europe or not, but we cannot leave Europe this way with a self-inflicted wound, the own goal, putting a gun at our own head, shooting ourselves, and making life miserable for the people who are the most vulnerable in our country. And you know, it, you know I, I, I do all these debates with uh, people who support Brexit. I remember there was this radio uh, interview, and there was this ardent advocate of Brexit, and he, was, and he was being asked by the interviewer all the time, he said, why are you so against Europe? Why are you so opposed to Europe? And getting no real answer. And then he said, is it ignorance or is it apathy? And the guy replied, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we, we've, we've, always, we've, always had, we've always had tensions with Europe. But nobody's minimizing the fact we've got uh, we've had disagreements on different things. I didn't want to join the Euro, but I wanted to be part of the European uh, Union. So we all have our own views about that. I, I had a predecessor who was also a brand called George Brown. Some of you may be old enough to remember. He was a foreign secretary and uh, tended to drink a lot more than I ever did <laughs> and tended to get into trouble. Harold Wilson actually sent him to Europe in the 1967 when Harold Wilson was the Prime Minister and decided that we would join the European uh, uh, community and he sent George Brown around Europe. The only problem was he was drunk when he was going around every part. So he got to France, and Charles de Gaulle was this austere president of France, and he didn't really uh, react kindly when George Brown walked in after a few drinks and started calling him Charlie, <laughs> and then talked about the French as the frogs. And so he had to leave France, and then he went to Belgium. This is actually true. He was doing a European tour, so he went to Belgium and had a few drinks, and he started complaining that the Belgians had done nothing during the Second World War. They spent all their time in pubs and in brothels instead of fighting the enemy, and he had to leave Belgium. And then he arrived in Vienna, and there's this great story of him arriving in Vienna, and they'd organized a magnificent diplomatic reception for him with all the music and everything else, and he sort of got, got the, the message wrong because the music started up, uh, and he, he thought as the principal foreign guest, he had to start by asking someone to dance with him. So he went across to this person in crimson and said, would you like to dance? And he got the reply, first of all, uh, you're drunk. <laughs> Secondly, this is not a waltz. This is the Austrian national anthem. <laughs> and, you, and you should be standing to attention. And then he said, and thirdly, I'm the Cardinal Arch Archbishop of Vienna. <laughs> so he had to leave Austria. Uh, so it all, nothing, nothing is ever so smooth in politics that things work out. But what's happening at the moment, I think we've got two views of Britain competing against each other. And I think we've really got to decide where we want to be. You see, there is one view that is invoking the Dunkirk spirit. And it says, better off standing alone, glorying in isolation. We always stood alone, and that was what, what worked in the Second World War. And of course, you know, Dunkirk, we were trying to get a deal with the French to merge with them. Churchill was. He was trying to get the Americans on board for the war. And the whole of the Commonwealth was being asked to support us. We weren't standing alone in the sense we wanted to stand alone. We stood alone out of necessity, not out of choice. And this idea that we can survive simply on our own, uh, look inwards, not think of ourselves as part of the continent in which we live, I think is something that most young people in particular, but older people who know what happened during the war years and what we had to do uh, to rebuild that continent, no, it does not make sense of the future. I believe we are a tolerant nation. I believe we believe in liberty. I believe we believe in fair play. I believe we believe in a responsible community. I believe we're outward looking, and I think we're at our best when we look outwards and show that we can lead in Europe rather than leave Europe. And I think at some point, we're gonna to have to come back and think, who do we really want to be? It's not just what kind of Brexit, it's what kind of Britain we want to be. And I think we're best standing tall in the world as a tolerant country, as an outward-looking country, engage with the rest of the world, and I think we're, that's where the future lies. But today... <laughs> but today, I end with this one thought. 
whether you were for or against Brexit, that is not the issue at the moment. The issue is, can we allow a no-deal Brexit to go ahead? Can we put at risk food supplies, medical supplies, components to industry? Can we put at risk all these things for what is a self-inflicted wound, as I said at the beginning, that will do damage to us more than it's damage to anybody else? And I want to call on everybody who's here, from the youngest, who I said should be voting, uh, to everybody else in this, this audience, to rise up, to tell your members of parliament, do not allow this no deal to go ahead, to tell the government, don't put our country at risk in this way, to try to build better for the future by standing up for a vision of Britain that is a Britain that is outward looking and ready and confident enough to face the future. It's a great pleasure to be in Birmingham and it's the best place to say that the future of British industry, which depends on what happens here, is best safeguarded if we avoid a no-deal Brexit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.